Well, hi everyone. Welcome here today to Webinar Land, uh, hosted right here and now by the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute. Uh, my name's Brendan Gleeson. I'm the director of that institute and I'm broadcasting from my flat here in North Melbourne. Hope everyone out there is as well as they can be. Um, really looking forward to the discussion and for your um, contribution and discussion with us today, people who have joined us from near and far. Um, so that's all terrific. Today's topic is degrowth, solidarity and the welfare state. Some pretty big themes uh, to tackle there, which is wonderful. We have two speakers and I'll introduce them in just a moment and then explain briefly the format uh, for today's uh, discussion, which as I said, will involve uh, some audience participation as well. Before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge the elders, both past and present and emerging of the Wurundjeri people who are the custodians of the land that I am on here today. Uh, I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands in which you are and our university campuses uh, are situated. <clears throat> okay, so we've uh, two speakers, two very valuable and valued members of the Melbourne Soci Sustainable Society Institute. Let me um, give you a quick bio on each. You'll be known to many of you, but um, good to fill out their details. So firstly, Associate Professor Anitra Nielsen, who joined uh, MISI, the Sustainable Society Institute, as a principal fellow earlier this year coming from a position uh, and some great work with our friends at RMIT University. Her work focuses on environmental sustainability, non-monetary economies and post-capitalist futures. Uh, she finalised her book, Small is Necessary, Shared Living on a Planet, 2018, while she was a Carson Fellow at the Rachel Carson Centre for Environment and Society at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, 2016 to 17 there. <clears throat> Recently, Anitra has worked on uh, three books, on degrowth, so a big contributor. She's the lead co-editor of Degrowth Collections in the Routledge Environmental Humanities series, which we commend to you. Firstly, Housing for Degrowth 2018, and then Food for, due, for Degrowth, which is due out in December. She's co-authored Exploring Degrowth, a critical guide 2020 this year, on which she'll speak today, uh, along with two other books in the Pluto Press Fireworks series coming out of the UK, for which she's a series editor. And her current work, Beyond Money, a post-capitalist strategy is to be published next year in 2021. So a voluminous and excellent output uh, from Anitra and she'll be speaking directly to some of that today. Uh, next, uh, the other uh, speaker interlocutor with us today is Professor Boris Frankel, who's an honorary principal fellow at NISI with us. And Boris has had over 40 years of teaching and research experience at a number of universities in Australia, Europe and the USA. Uh, he's a well-known social theorist, author and political economist and cultural critic. Boris has a strong research interest in Australian and international comparative political economy and social policy. Boris's current research interests include the political, socio-political problems of transitioning to a post-carbon economy, with a particular focus on creating sustainable employment and public services in a volatile global economy characterised by high indebtedness, fiscal crises, political gridlock, and resistance by powerful socioeconomic forces against necessary public policy measures. We know a lot about these things. We'll hear more from Boris. So the, the um, format is quite simple. Anitra and Boris will both present, make short presentations in sequence, starting with Anitra. Then they'll have a bit of discussion amongst themselves, pick up some threads, and then it'll be over to you guys, uh, um, the audience, to. Uh, submit some questions. Please do that through the Q&A function. Uh, now, we may not be able to respond. There's quite a few hundred people here today um, to all questions, but we'll do our best. And we'll transmit all questions to the speakers so that they'll get a chance to consider them, even if they don't get a chance today to respond to you um, directly. Um, you won't hear or see from me until um, the end. So the focus will be on Boris and Anitra with uh, the wonderful Claire Denby supporting us as we go along. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Anitra to start the event. Yes, well, thank you all for participating by Zoom and to Missy for organizing this event. Uh, many thanks to Brendan for introducing us uh, and to Anna Dunn for her preliminary work and to Claire Denby, who's doing the complicated technical work today. Finally, special thanks to my colleague, Boris Frankel, who agreed to join me in this event. 
To begin at the beginning, radical independent publisher Pluto Press in London has published books of mine for over a decade. And last year, they invited me to co-found a new book series called Fireworks, which aims to explain key terms, movements and issues of the 21st century. 2020 has seen the first three Fireworks books launched. Claire, it'd be great if you could put up the slides showing those titles now, thanks. Degrowth was one of the first topics identified and I was charged with editing a collection and or finding a suitable author. Without going into the whys or wherefores, ultimately I co-authored the work with a prominent spokesperson for both French and international degrowth movements, Vincent Ligi. However, when we were hastily writing our foreword in April, I got an email from a New York activist scholar and friend asking advice on publishing a book she was organizing via an international collective reporting on grassroots responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. A well-known leftist and Occupy activist, Marina Citroen had written pioneering work on horizontalism and autonomy, solidarity and techniques of grassroots democracy. Within a week or two, she signed a contract with Pluto to contribute pandemic solidarity to the fireworks series with a deadline of as soon as you can. I was seconded to edit chapters with riveting material. It starts with a chapter on Rahaba, Northeast Syria, where we see what happens when you already have street communes and municipal councils in place to democratically decide what you will do to prevent and minimize the onslaught of a pandemic. The chapters roll on through Turkey, Iraq, Taiwan, South Korea, to end up in South America and with Turtle Island, the indig indigenous people's name for the half continent we know as North America. What Collectiva Sembra reveal here is the many weaknesses of capitalism, especially among disadvantaged and marginalized communities in a range of cultures. In contrast, the strength of grassroots organizing in the face of such a disaster, especially where community governance and prefigurative modes of local community production are already established. So pandemic solidarity is a good diving board for talking about exploring degrowth. By the way, Boris will talk to Ursula Hughes' work. A point of clarity, exploring degrowth presents mainstream thinking goals and strategies in the movement. So it doesn't always express what I think. Degrowth is a movement of activists riding on the thoughts of a stream of theorists, such as Andre Gortz, Ivan Illich, Cornelius Castilleradis, and Murray Bookchin. There's a lot of confusion about degrowth. Many imagine growth at one end of the spectrum, delivering everything everyone wants, and degrowth at the other end where no one has anything, scarcity, austerity, and poverty. Instead, you need to think about degrowth in this way. Degrowth is to quality as growth is to quantity. They're opposites, they're antonyms. Degrowth is about quality of life, fulfilling everyone's needs. The first principle of degrowth is reducing inequality. It's about collective sufficiency, what degrowth is called frugal abundance, having time, using simple and appropriate technologies. As we write in our glossary, frugal abundance means practices, philosophies and livelihoods that respect limits, that are rich and full in meaning. If degrowth starts with the observation that Earth has limits and we must live within its biocapacity, it's just as much about more secure, less stressful and enjoyable lives 
reversing the seesawing overconsumption and poverty that's characteristic of growth economies. The degrowth movement has a vision of a community-based mode of production, of direct control of local production, so small bioregions are essentially collectively sufficient. Strategies to get there include an unconditional autonomy allowance, which fulfills basic needs via local production. Rather than a monetary basic minimum income, the unconditional autonomy allowance might well be delivered substantially in kind, and it can be pursued through state reforms and or through collective degrowth activities. Degrowth activ activists pursue such collective activities. For instance, Carganomia, founded by my co-author and others in Budapest, is a self-organizing socio-cultural degrowth center producing food on a four hectare organic vegetable farm at the edge of Budapest, distributed as vegetable boxes by cargo bikes that are made, repaired and hired out by Carganomia. It supports research on care work and partners with other degrowth initiatives. As such, degrowth activism is quite material. It's productive, self-governing and cultural. In chapter three of Exploring Degrowth, we analyse degrowth activism in four spheres. First, as conducted by and for individuals. Second, collectively. Third, as acts of resistance, say to massive road or water infrastructure. And fourth, read the degrowth project, where many strategies converge. As such, degrowth has been influential in Europe. So much so, the co-editor of the Routledge Housing for Degrowth collection that um, I co-edited, no, we presented at a three-day European Union conference on post-growth in Brussels in 2018, with hundreds of European Commission, Commission policy staff in attendance. Our paper argued that governments could support degrowth with policies of enablement, enabling grassroots activities of building our own housing, making alternative housing activities mainstream. The degrowth concept of open localization reverses globalization and standardization in favor of diverse cultures and environments to enrich life and biodiversity. It's a strong countervailing force against reactionary protectionism, closed borders and cultural suspicion. The pandemic has already introduced us to the notion of frugal abundance. The world over, people and states are asking, well, what's really essential? And how might we most easily satisfy these basic needs. We see the weakness of long global supply chains rupturing at various points, resulting in unmet demand, uncertainty and anxiety. We can see how useful it is to have direct links with locally produced and supplied food and other necessities, even toilet paper. In contrast to the false security of growth as in bigger, better and faster, degrowth nurtures a transformative culture of minimalism, of slowing down and valuing diverse human and ecological qualities and the perpetually cyclical dynamics of life. In the process, neo-colonial, expansive and exploitative, managerial and hierarchical drives wither under horizontalist approaches and skills applied to collective governance, collective reliance and collective autonomy. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown the great advantages of locally accessible goods and services, sharing knowledge and skills that can be readily applied in solidarity with direct democracy and an economy 
oriented on needs, not money, profit, debts, and growth. If all this sounds abnormal, it's the purpose of degrowth to be so. In short, the movement focuses on realizing a politically novel, economically secure, environmentally feasible, and culturally comfortable world. Over to you, Boris. You'll need to unmute. Thanks very much, Anitra. I hope everybody can hear me now. Look, uh, I'm going to, in the brief 10 minutes that we've got, um, cover a little bit about uh, Ursula Hughes' new book and also link that to Anitra and uh, Vonson Ligier's new book as well on degrowth. So uh, they're quite clearly different books focusing on quite different topics, but I'd like to draw some of the connections between the two of them. What we see with Ursula Hughes' book is that she's a, a long a time researcher in social welfare and labor processes, and she's very much preoccupied with trying to explain the type of world that we are entering. She focuses principally on the UK, but many of her type of arguments are also relevant to other countries such as Australia. And what she covers there is the fact that we've got more workers working on digital platforms with insecure, precarious work. There have been significant cuts in welfare payments and the type of welfare support that is available, especially to people in the UK. And she looks at the way in which uh, especially women and families, sole parents and uh, a whole range of other families are struggling within the current climate, both before COVID and, uh, and during COVID. And this situation will certainly be exacerbated by the massive rise in unemployment that we see in the UK. And like many other capitalist countries, a significant you know, challenge to maintaining conventional growth. So in fact, we're seeing degrowth, unofficial degrowth, being implemented in so many countries, including Australia, but it's quite different to the planned degrowth that the degrowth is want. This is unplanned recession, depression, call it what you will, depending on the country that we look at. So uh, what um, Ursula Hughes looks at is the way in which a whole range of new alternative policies can be implemented. And she, uh, she's rather ambivalent on the universal basic income proposal she both favours it, yet more of her arguments actually go to suggesting why it's a problematic um, uh, policy uh, uh, kind of proposal, because she talks about, um, she doesn't really address the issue of how it will be funded. She mentions some people who've been analysing it, but she warns that any proposed UBI would be could be in fact regressive if it uh, is funded by taxation on low and middle income people and the tax is distributed or redistributed to people who don't need it. So she, I think that's a very important warning about the UBI, but um, unless, and what she advocates is in fact increasing the minimum wage in the UK, because unless you increase minimum wage levels, you pitch the UBI at a very low level, and therefore you both affect, you impact low income people, first of all, by the taxes that they have to pay. And she's referring here not to people on welfare benefits, but people who are in paid employment and who still have to pay taxes. So if, uh, if you can be on the minimum income or slightly above it, 10 or 20%, but you're still going to be I think negatively impacted by any UBI that requires in increased funding, because at the moment, most tax is collected from people who perform wage labor. And it's collected from people who are either directly from their wages or indirectly through consumption taxes or what we call GST and other type of indirect taxes. So any alternative proposal that degrowth as favour, especially 
such as a, G, a UBI, has to be carefully weighed up against its feasibility, who will actually be paying for it, and how does it impact on equality? So uh, that's, you know, there are, there are some of the arguments that Ursula uh, proposes. And I think we really have to look at both the positive contribution that she makes and also the type of uh, issues that she doesn't really address. I'd like to, in the remaining several minutes, link her work to the book from Anitra uh, on degrowth. Uh, because what uh, Anitra's book actually uh, focuses on is not state organized policies, but a whole range, as she's mentioned, decentralized uh, autonomous activity carried out by a range of groups across the world. Now, as an introduction to degrowth, for those many people who are unfamiliar with it, I think it's a, a very good introduction because it covers many of the basic issues, the philosophy of degrowth, the organizational aspects of degrowth movements, the particular goals that they uh, seek to achieve, and some of the political strategies that they've tried to implement. But what the book doesn't address, and here I'm not expecting every book to address all issues, but so that we can have some type of discussion after I finish speaking, I'm particularly concerned about the political strategy of degrowth. And as Anitra has mentioned, degrowth, the ideas behind degrowth are not new. They've been around for at least 45 or more years. And um, the problem really is that most of the advocates of degrowth are very good at telling us what, uh, why we need degrowth, what's wrong with contemporary societies, what's what are the dangers of incessant growth and why we need to transform this whole economy and social structure if we want a sustainable world. I concur completely with those objectives, but I uh, would strongly disagree with the political strategies that are used to achieve those goals. What I would like to draw attention to is the division amongst degrowthers. We have, on the one hand, many degrowthers who engage in anti-politics. They are suspicious of parties, of governments, of large na nationwide movements, let alone international organisations. But especially at the national level, they uh, pursue an anti-politics. And what I mean by an anti-politics is that they pref prefer uh, local, decentralized, uh, autonomous, horizontal structures, but you cannot, in my opinion, achieve degrowth objectives. And here I'd like to qualify that Anitra doesn't believe in this herself because she would favor more state uh, kind of initiatives, not just state, but a co she, needs, she understands that um, degrowth cannot be just achieved on its own, but it needs state institutions to facilitate many of these activities as well, uh, but not to dominate the degrowth movements. But what, I'm, I'm, what I would like to say, returning back to most of the degrowthers, is that they oppose engagement with the state. They're invisible, largely invisible in everyday political activities, apart from big kind of actions, say, on the climate emergency or various other activities related to environmental or housing or other type of issues. So what we've got here is a situation where we've got anti-politics on the one side, and then we've got other degrowthers who believe in planned degrowth. And if you are going to have planned degrowth, that's not just an unplanned re recession or a depression, then it's absolutely necessary for degrowthers to specify what kind of economic policies, what kind of tax policies, what kind of 
general urban renewal policies that all involve local, state or federal governments, what kind of policies do they favour? What kind of technologies they favour? How are you going to descale particular industries? How are you going to decelerate various forms of unwanted consumption without hurting the most vulnerable people? All of these things require planning at a certain level. I'm not talking about planning in the old Soviet central five-year plans. I'm talking about some form of planning that involves state institutions. So what's really missing from Anitra's book is that discussion of how we get to the objectives that she wants to achieve without simply relying on autonomous decentralized organizations. So um, uh, we've got many actions, and I'll finish here in a minute. Have I got another minute to go or two? I think maybe a, a minute. Just to wind that up and say, I think we need to really combine degrowth in terms of its objectives with the institutional structures that we need to facilitate that transition. So perhaps we can open this for discussion. Over to you, Anitra. Thanks very much, Boris. That was great. Um, yes, look, I, um, my position, if I had to, if I had to go one way or the other way, I'd go grassroots. So um, to that extent, um, actions through the state for me are necessary in the um, contemporary political um, environment and structures. Uh, but what degrowth uh, actually faces is a capitalist state and the big problem with capitalism is, is that it has no operating systems for degrowing. This is probably the major weakness that all sustainability initiatives and actions and policies actually have to deal with, and, and many don't in a very open kind of way, but degrowth to a large extent is a lot more open about that than um, other groups. So there are a lot of problems with actually working through current state structures. There's lots of silos of policy making, whereas degrowth requires kind of like multiple changes across silos, getting rid of some, initiating others, that kind of thing. So that where we're headed is so different from the current kind of political environment and political structures, that that is a great difficulty and largely explains a lot of the grassroots organising. So that there's a kind of tightrope that a lot of degrowth people walk between having actions, protests, where they're actually demanding from government to stop certain developments um, or to bring in progressive measures but at the same time, we find it really, really important to engage in pre-figurative kind of structures like cargonomia that um, I gave the example of, but also to ourselves actually organise in such a way that we can prove that horizontal and direct decision making works across scales so that subsidiarity actually can be achieved. That's direct democracy at very local levels. Um, so because there's a lot of problems in terms of the risks of co-option and misrepresentation and diminished power uh, when we engage in state politics and working with political parties and trade unions. So, I mean, I might hand that back to you at this point. Well, look, uh, I agree about your comments about the capitalist state that we confront. But, uh, for example, you mentioned uh, degrowth as attending a summit in Brussels in 2018, proposing an alternative strategy for the European Union. 
Now that's not possible without state institutional involvement, not only at national level, as you know, but across the 27 countries of the EU. And that, of course, uh, if you want to create in, uh, equality, if you want, I mean, I don't personally favor a, a universal basic income because I don't see how it's feasible financially, but degrowthers do not go into the nitty gritty of what's needed. If I've got to put it bluntly, 45 years of degrowth have effectively resulted in almost permanent invisibility. I mean, if you ask most people in their daily lives in Australia or any other countries, do they know what degrowth is? Do they know how they'd be able to sustain an income, a livelihood, how they could uh, recreate their households, their local communities into greens, commons, how they could have these horizontal structures. Most of them uh, either haven't heard of it or, wouldn't, or would be quite worried about how they're going to sustain their livelihoods without some form of employment, without some form of uh, fiscal state, which is able to distribute revenue and support all the people who are reliant on social benefits. So we have this paradoxical situation that while the aim is good, the possibility of moving from an almost invisible political movement, which is only really well known amongst a tiny fraction of people who are uh, local activists uh, in a range of countries, um, that you know creates real political strategic problems in the future. And take, for example, the yellow vest that you mentioned in, the, in your book. Um, well, most of them were from the right wing, although later on after they were very active, people from the left and degrowthers joined and also demanded a whole range of different proposals. But on the whole, uh, activities such as Yellow Vest are kind of flash hotspots that more or less fizzle out after a while, leaving no particular policies in place. Okay, so you've said a number of things there, so it's hard to know which, where, where to start. We haven't been going for 45 years. The degrowth movement has um, drawn on people's thinking that has uh, been out there and in books for 45 years, but it's really only been um, prominent as a movement for the last 10 years. And yes, it's very focused on Europe and in particular in France, where degrowth is now so well known that a poll last year um, in France um, actually had more French people saying that they wanted a degrowth future than they wanted some kind of high tech future. So um, in Australia, it's, it's actually growing quite quickly now. So for instance, in the Food for Degrowth book that we've got coming out later in the year, um, it's topped and tailed by uh, Australian contributors. One is Patrick Jones, who with uh, his partner Meg Ullman is actually living degrowth in, um, in a very obvious, visible, um, highly promoted way. They have YouTube videos, um, so you can go to their channel. And they've got a very strong chapter um, in the book that engages with um, conflicts in terms of our Indigenous roots here um, as white Australians and all of that kind of thing. Um, other prominent people are, of course, our, our colleague at Missy, um, Samuel Alexander, Brendan Gleeson, um, has uh, co-authored a, a good work, a very good work, strong work on degrowth, um, as could be applied in the suburbs. Uh, Tred Trainer from the University of New South Wales, not only um, taught um, and researched for numbers of years, but has his own educational centre that's been going for decades um, out of, uh, in Sydney. Uh, Terry Lay, University of Newcastle. Now, degrowth has substantially um, grown out of uh, ecological economics. So the Australian New Zealand Society of Ecological Economics has quite um, a number of people who've been influenced by and who engage with um, and or promote uh, degrowth. 
the Australian en Environmental Law Association and the New Economy Network Australia both um, have uh, strong degrowth uh, themes in their works and their events. And the Australian president of the uh, Australia Food Sovereignty Alliance, Tammy Jones, um, is a degrowth person who actually lives here in central Victoria. And she's a pig farmer. So Look, uh, yeah, we're sort of, it's, it's becoming more prominent. And, it's, and maybe uh, this is, um, you know, it, it sort of depends what circles you're in or whatever. But I'd also like to take up um, about, I think that you make some really good comments about the unconditional um, basic income. And there'd actually be a lot of degrowthers who would agree with you about that. So in the fifth chapter um, of our book, we talk about an unconditional or universal autonomy allowance. And that is an in-kind allowance as much as it is or might be a monetary one. And the idea is, is that you would link there to sort of unconditional basic services, free water, the, the kinds of policies that you've seen in Cuba or whatever, where there are a number of services that everyone gets and there is a kind of public service and, but we would see this as broken up and being very much collectively designed in local areas. Can we I just open... interrupt for a second there, because um, you've certainly listed all the uh, people who, in the academic world, who are uh, involved with degrowth. I'm talking about the larger populace, which is in Australia and most other countries apart from France, is not involved with degrowth, and it's very, it's virtually unknown to them. I would like them to be aware of it but I'm trying to comment about the reality that they are not at the moment. And in France, where they began fairly early, about 10 years ago, and what I mean by 45 years is not about degrowth under that name, but other no enormous number of movements and individuals who favoured uh, uh, forms of degrowing capitalist economy. They didn't call it degrowth in those days. Sure. But uh, get, getting back to the present, uh, what we have in France is a refusal on the part of most degrowthers to be involved in a national organisation. They want decentralised organisation. And so if, for example, most people in France favour some form of degrowth over a high tech uh, solution, the question then becomes, where do degrowthers then go as a movement to realise those objectives? They can't just realise them on their own in their numerous little tiny uh, autonomous horizontal groups. They really need to transform national state government policies. So that's what I'm trying to, you know, highlight. I, I know it's actually, sorry that, sorry, uh, Anitra, you were going to yeah. show some. Yeah. Degrowth in Movements, which is a book that actually shows a lot of the um, connections between degrowth and a lot of other movements. I mean, you could make similar, and, and there are similar um, criticisms made of movements such as Occupy, uh, or many of the movements, or ecofeminism, or, you know, like, and there's... And we have to make those criticisms because they've, they've been utter failures. They've ended in nothing apart from transforming consciousness at a certain level. But in terms of actually achieving their objectives, Occupy was an abysmal failure. And uh, most, uh, look at the, um, uh, we've got Helen Reddy who died today. And when we take, you know, her uh, anthem and what women have achieved, well, it's a very mixed record without uh, it, it, it can't be just local politics. It's got to be a transformation of larger national social policies as well. Well, there's, there's a problem in putting the boot in because I would have to say that what have more state-inclined leftists achieved over the last 40 years? I mean, we've got Trump in power. We've had Margaret Thatcher. We've got Boris Johnson. Like, it, we've, it, got all, we've got all of those, but let's put, 
put it uh, at the nitty gritty. Without large organized political labor movements and that, we wouldn't have the standard of living that we've got today. But they've yeah. shrunk. All of those movements, all yeah. of the labor movements have I shrunk. Know. They've shrunk, and that is the problem. I'm not denying any of that. I'm not, a, I'm not an advocate for the trade union movement or the Labour Party or any of these. I'm simply commenting on the reality of what degrowth movements are able to achieve on their own at the moment, and hopefully they can grow. But when they do grow to a certain point, they will nevertheless encounter real institutional decisions. Do they remain a grassroots movement? or do they enter electoral politics, or what do they do? Because you cannot uh, uh, transform local issues without some involvement of the judicial, legal, uh, uh, fiscal structure of a country like Australia. I, th I think that you've identified some really um, strong and important issues that are actually faced by lots of movements today. Um, and as I say, I think one of the, the biggest problems is, is that when you face capitalism and a capitalist state and you've got no operating systems um, to degrow, then it's extremely difficult for the degrowth movement um, to actually engage with the kind of instruments that are generally used by capitalist states and, and by active capitalist businesses and that kind of thing. I'm just aware that we're probably going to need to move yes. more to question and answer because I think we've probably both put our positions. Um, and thank you very much for that. Um, I think we have a couple of questions up there or more. Would you yeah, like to so, answer any of them? Um, I'm just having a look because some of these uh, questions are sort of pretty much asking similar things to what we've been discussing. Um, One question is why engage with current structures when they are incompatible with anti-capitalism? Can you build a grassroots movement for system change without anti-politics? Yeah, good one. <laughs> um, equally, there are some, you know, there are there are similar questions to those that you've been raising, um, Boris. In that sort of like, you know, is is there a main policy that we can sort of identify um, with degrowth? And we do actually spend quite a lot of time in our book, don't we? Sort of unpacking why that a, a kind of obvious answer to that. Is, is not available. Um, can I just respond quickly to that mm. question about um, can you build a grassroots movement for system change without anti-politics? One of the, um, the, the real dangers at the moment, and it's been pervasive for a number of years now, is that uh, when uh, activists try to build up an alternative anti-capitalist movement, they often encounter the same resistance from the public because of the general uh, critique and disillusionment with mainstream politics and with fake news, with all the lying, with all the various activities of, of the Trumps and company, we see a general devaluation of po political activity in the society as a whole. So I'm curious to know how you uh, mobilize people who are very kind of suspicious of and disillusioned with any kind of political activity. Yeah, that's true. I'm just looking at um, also another contribution that's been made by someone, um, just talking about um, mutual aid and, and the extent to which that, that sort of does feed into a sort of more anarchist um, and mutual aid associations structures. I mean, one of the things that comes out in Marina Citroen and Collective Assembra's work, Pandemic Solidarity, is, uh, you know, they, they have uh, examples such as the Kurds and in Greece, where you've already got very strong radical grassroots um, organisations that are established, and how quickly they were able to move in terms of responding to the pandemic. Uh, when we look that 
we're facing a climate emergency and we saw the bushfires here in Australia, we are actually looking now at situations where I think that grassroots organisation is going to be uh, really highlighted because it's immediate uh, and if, if it's done well. But as you say, where people are apathetic, they, it, there's a, a massive risk that, that, that people um, will actually not know how to act. And, and I suppose it's one of the reasons why a lot of deep growthers and people in other like organisations uh, really like to uh, share skills and share their ideas because a lot of younger activists feel uh, very threatened by climate change and, and the kind of um, disaster environment that, they're, that, that they feel that they're now living in, that they want to be skilled and they want also to be able to be part of the decision making because there's so little effective decision making from the top down. So which raises fact, the issue in your book, you talk about adopting the snail's pace and that that uh, results in a more effective uh, change than trying to rush things through or immediate type of change. Um, what do you say to people who argue that we can't afford the snail's pace, which comes from Ivan Illich and others in earlier years? Uh, Illich wrote at a time when there was no climate emergency, what do we do about a climate emergency and the snail's pace? I, don't, I, I think that the, the symbol of the snail is a lot more complex than being slow as a snail. So uh, the snail, um, as Illich um, and certain others saw it, had all the benefits of actually having built a shell that, that, that although it was circular and could go on forever, actually stopped at a certain point so that it wasn't unwieldy in terms of being able to carry it around on its own body. And so I think that's got, uh, there are a lot of references there to sort of like ecological footprints and uh, yeah, the very heavy um, and loaded way in which growth has um, encumbered people with overconsumption and that kind of thing. So there's that aspect of the snail. And in uh, the slow movement, for instance, uses the, the snail even more as its symbol than the degrowth movement. And there it's the emphasis on quality. Um, snails need, mean another thing, Boris, to French people. Okay. Yes, I know. <laughs> and, um, you know, so uh, the, the other aspect of it is, is, is that my co-author has actually worked uh, very high up in uh, transport um, uh, strategies and um, in emer transport emergencies. And uh, there, for instance, once you actually get some great emergency occurring, the whole idea is, is to really slow down, really think, but to be really prepared. And the whole idea of degrowth is, is that we're actually, we are planning for a degrowth future. We are planning for a descent in terms of energy and material use. And so we need to be prepared and we need to have our one, two, three. What do we do? And... Yeah. What so, does that mean? You're, you're planning for an energy descent. Yeah. What does it mean? What does it mean? Yes, it because, means, uh, it means it, okay. Why do why do we bother? Why do we bother enlarging um, highways or spending more money on roads when we actually should be using um, public transport? All of those kinds of things. I, I understand what your objectives are. Yeah. How do you uh, how do you um, achieve the switch to public transport and the end of the freeways around Melbourne? Well, degrowth activists have been involved in protesting against big infrastructure, you know, for the last decade. Like, that's what the ZAD in um, France was all about. And uh, people... I, I know they've been protesting, sorry to interrupt, but, but how do you actually gain the sufficient power to 
to stop the construction process on roads? How do you actually do that through horizontal autonomous groups when you need power and state government to cancel the freeway construction or not to build any more of them or to transform them, the roads and car spaces into green commons so that food and uh, leisure activities can be taken? How do you do that without <laughs> political power? We see, we see two prongs to it. We, we don't discount actually having an influence in terms of politicians. The whole thing of protesting is to influence the politicians and to stop those kinds of things happening. But the other thing is, is about taking people with you. And so just my next door neighbours, people down the road, everyone else needs to understand why you might be making that um, that plea to government, why you might be advocating for public transport, that kind of thing. So that, those are the reasons. Uh, well, there's a question here. Do you think that degrowth is possible as a glo at a global level? The, the degrowth movement is international and we, uh, our, there are two ways, two um, main ways that we organise internationally. And one of those is, is that we have degrowth conferences every two years. And uh, the other way, and I mean, say this year, where there was one that was planned for Manchester, uh, a lot of that was done by Zoom. Um, and there is, there's a lot of um, communication that is done by Zoom by, um, in, with degrowth events. But the, um, and so that's available to people internationally. Um, but also we have degrowth.info is an international hub that um, is at the moment being organised by a collective in Germany. And so people who are doing any events anywhere in the world put up news about what they're doing there. And um, yeah, so also there are various organisations. So just because we're decentralised doesn't mean that we don't have nodes. It's just that we don't have a central node, but we have lots of different nodes. So Wuppertal Institute, for instance, has um, a degrowth theme. Um, there's also the global, global Tapestry of Alternatives, which is a Global South node. You know, there's that but, kind of but thing. But I ask you in regard to the Global South, as it's called, mm -hmm. um, activists there say that uh, frugality by choice is a Eurocentric idea and is not applicable to us. What, what do you have to say to that? Yeah, but frugality, we are not preaching frugality to people who live in poverty. OK, we're arguing that people who have more actually um, are morally obliged to have less so that other people can live. And but what, uh, does the degrowth movement have any explicit policies that are aimed at low and middle income countries that are uh, desperately in need of social transformation? Well, so those countries have given birth to movements that are akin to ours and joined with ours, like Buen Verdia and uh, environmental rights movements um, and that kind of thing. And so we join with them. And um, we very much learn from them because they actually, they live in certain ways, simple, appropriate technology ways, which we can learn from. So... That's a, an extremely fruitful sort of international engagement that we have, that some of that degrowth in movements book goes into chapter by chapter. But also it's, you know, the idea of um, having an unconditional or universal autonomy allowance is sort of built on that idea of there being equity across the world and about basic needs being met locally. And it's also about meeting or matching rather an unconditional um, basic income with an acceptable maximum income. I think, um, have we got another minute or two or, we, we, or do we have to wrap it up? Is there anything else you'd like to add, Anitra? 
or Brendan is here, just appeared on the... Brendan. Hi, both. Um, I think we're, we're nearing the end now, but if both of you just briefly want to make a closing uh, statement, that'd be great. Well, I'd like to say that we've got quite a lot of questions um, up here and in as much as we are able to forward to people who've been part of this um, Zoom event, um, I'm prepared to, you know, answer to the best of my capacity um, some of those questions um, that could be forwarded to them later. Great. Yes, well, I, I'd simply uh, like to thank Anitra I've been the devil's advocate for a number of uh, positions here at the moment, although I still have grave doubts about horizontalism as a political strategy for the future. But I do believe that we need plan D growth. How it's achieved is something that requires detailed socioeconomic and cultural policies on a whole range of areas from industry to agriculture. So I leave it at that. Thank you, Boris. Thank you very much. Okay, that's that's a good ending. No one gets the last word. I think it's um, it's sort of coming together of opinions and recognising. Uh, well, let me recognise for you. I think you've had a great exchange. Um, there's some differences of opinion, but very respectfully put and held. Uh, and that's something we should always commit to. And we thank you, um, Boris and Anitra, for a great and illuminating discussion, going to some really core ideas. Um, around degrowth, we, uh, as you noted, we've had a, a series of questions and not all of which uh, could be addressed by uh, you both in this format in this way in this time, but Anitra has given some commitment to following them up and we can, um, we'll collect and collate those questions and um, supply them to you. So questioners, your, your, your questions are not lost. We'll um, pick them up for you. Um, once again, thanks to the speakers and thanks for everyone for attending uh, the webinar. The Everyone who's attended and has supplied us with an email through registering will be sent a link to the recording for this um, event. So there we are, posterity, and I'm sure there'll be a link off our website at the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute. So uh, I'm going to sign off with one more uh, thanks and uh, also especially to Claire Denby, who um, the speakers have thanked, have done a lot of work, has done a lot of work to um, bring this event together. So with that, uh, goodbye and good luck and best wishes to everyone, including our uh, listeners and participants. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Bye. Thanks, Anitra. Thanks, Boris. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Right.